Well, good evening. I'm Andy Silo Carroll. I am the um, uh, editor at large for the New York Jewish Week. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this folio cultural series that we do with the UJ Federation of New York, um, our partner in this for many years now. Um, and I want to thank my uh, my uh, co-conspirators in bringing you this wonderful event. Uh, that's uh, Thea Weaseltier, who's director of strategic projects and public programs at Seventy Faces Media, our parent company, and of course the the folks at UJA, especially Graham Cannon, Susan Kahn, and Lori Kalinsky. Uh, if you're here for Rabbi Irving Yitz Greenberg, you're in the right place. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, my teacher and my former neighbor in Riverdale, New York, uh, who's had a hand in many of the most important Jewish institutions of the past 50 years. They include co-founding the SAR Academy, that's the co edu um, Educationally Progressive Modern Orthodox Day School in Bronx. He's co-founder of CLAW, the Jewish Pluralist Think Tank. He served as chairman of the President's Commission on the Holocaust, subsequently the chairman of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. He co-founded the Student Struggle for Soviet Jewry. Uh, he was president of the J.J. Greenberg Institute for the Advancement of Jewish Life, professor and chairman of the Department of Jewish Studies of City College of the City of New York, and of the City University of New York and founding president of the Jewish Life Network, Steinhardt Foundation. In addition to all this institution building, uh, uh, Rabbi Greenberg has been a writer and scholar of whom uh, it's been said that no Jewish thinker has had a greater impact on the American Jewish community in the last decades than Irving Yitz Greenberg. Uh, now living in Israel, Rabbi Greenberg has written a new book, The Triumph of Life, um, which, in which he argues that we're in the beginning of a new era in Jewish history and religion. Uh, it's my great, great pleasure to, to welcome Rabbi Greenberg from Israel, where he's honored us by staying up quite late. Um, Rabbi, it's, it's great to have you. Thank you. Greetings from Jerusalem, the eternal capital of the Jewish people. Absolutely. Um, I, I wanted to begin on a personal note, which is that you've written really what many people are calling a magnum opus, pulling together a, a lifetime of your thought and theology. Um, and you recently joined the faculty of Hadar, the uh, post-denominational educational institute in New York. And you're doing this at a stage in life, I'm going to say, where others might prefer putting up their feet and resting on their laurels. So I wanna ask you, what's your secret? And uh, what's driven you to write and teach for what I think now is 70 years? Um, thank you very much. Of course, I, the answer in part is I'm grateful that I'm, I'm, I'm not suffering from dementia, which as you know, is a certain percentage of age that has been happened. So I, um, I don't think I deserve any special credit for getting it done. Well, that's the age of 90. I'm half tempted to say uh, the first joke, the, the fellow asks, is this a nonprofit organization? And they say, no, yes, but it wasn't planned that way. So <laughs> I would say I didn't plan to do this at 90. I actually started to write this book at, seven, at 76, which in retrospect was a kid. The final comment on that is that, you know, the Torah says, stand up out of respect for someone with white hair and honor uh, an older person, but then the Talmud immediately adds, well, uh, Zakain, an older person, only only if he's gotten wise in all those years. So my answer is, I'm, I don't think one should factor in the judgment of how old I am, but rather how wise or how useful is the book. Oh, that's great. Well, I wanted to, um, I want to talk about your book. Um, uh, your book is about a Jewish world shattered by the Holocaust and forced to create a new reality in what you call the third great era in Jewish history. Uh, it's an era marked by Jews taking responsibility for their own destiny, uh, from creating the state of Israel to developing new diaspora institutions. And at the core of the concept, it's in the title of your book, is, is the triumph of life, um, the idea that all humans are created in God's image. Um, radical pluralism has always been a part of your career, um, and what you call a heroic age of the Jewish people. So. I want to take these ideas one by one, and maybe we can start by the title of the book. What do you mean by Judaism as the religion of life? Well, again, um, I think it's a very important contribution 
of the Jewish religion. In essence, what it says is that life, first of all, that God is life. God is ultimate form of life. God sustains life. God loves life. Melech HaFetz B'chaim, it says in, the, in, in Rosh Hashanah, in Davening, the, the king who lusts for life. So, But it, more important, what the religion teaches is that this earth can and should be turned into a paradise, a Gan Eden, a, a Garden of Eden for life, and that human life, the highest form of life thus far, uh, is called by God to be a partner in making sure that life wins out. One other comment, and that's probably worth a second question, which is that what the religion tries to do is not only get human beings, or the Jewish community, but every community, to join in improving, upgrading the world, repairing the world, to sustain life at, at its highest level. But it, it says something even more challenging. It says to every Jewish person, this is the religion, every moment of your life can be made into a maximum deepening upgrading of life or some form of degradation of life, death, loss of quality. And so it says, take every action, every normal life action in your life, eating, talking, walking, <laughs> working, driving, transporting, and study it and redo it, reshape it to maximize mm -hmm. the element of life and to minimize the element of death. So it's a religion that really asks people to live life. And the holiest thing you can do is to live life deeply. And, and by and we're talking quality, like you were talking quality as well as quantity. We're talking about public policy that increases the ability, the dignity of every person to live this life to the fullest. It's not a right. selfish, um, you know, take care of yourself, take care of your body, but a, it's a worldview. It's a worldview. In fact, I just, another example, the best example, the abortion issue. It is falsely reported as pro-choice against pro-life. But in fact, what abortion is really about is quantity of life and quality of life. There is a Jewish position that is against abortion and says once you conceive a life, human beings have no right to interfere and prevent it from becoming and developing a full life. That's the anti-abortion. But the pro-abortion is saying Quality of life is no less important, and we are called to upgrade the quality of life. And therefore, if this life in gestation will threaten the mother's life or destroy her life, or if this life suffers from Tay-Sachs disease or a disease that will destroy and really take away the capacity of the life of this child, then one can choose quality of life and protect, protect that quality by an abortion. So the answer is down the line and across every every human activity, there is this potential and there is this choice. So I want to get back uh, in a few minutes to uh, the notion of tikkun olam and repairing the world. But I still I, I want to work through some of the other ideas in your book. The other is, um, if you can describe for me the, the third stage, we're in the third stage of covenant and religion. And maybe explain that idea and perhaps why that idea has been sometimes controversial. Um, <laughs> let me back up half a minute about this question of life, because I want to say one more implication of Judaism and Israel life is that the central command of the tradition is choose life. And what, what I learned in the course of studying the tradition is that that choice is literally made every moment of our lives. I mean, the next, the next food that I eat Jewish of Kashrut, really, ritual is about vegetarianism. Ideally, you should not kill another organism in life in order to live yourself. If you don't eat, you will die. But if you do eat, ideally, you should not kill. Now that Kashrut says, ideal is to be vegetarian in the Garden of Eden, and in the Messianic age, we'll all be vegetarians. But in the short run, we'll permit meat in the real world with restrictions. So all the restrictions of kashrut are about eating meat. So again, eating, you take it for granted, but in fact, in choosing how you eat, you're choosing life in more than one way. And I would add to this, therefore. So part of kashrut, of ethical, at least in the third era, is would you eat a species that's being overfished? No, that's choosing death. Would you, in the course of eating, cause the animals to suffer? Would you, would you exploit and hurt those who prepare the food? 
All of this is part of choosing life properly. So I, I want to stress this choosing life is the crucial issue. And I come back to the third era. What, I, what I've said, what I've argued in the book is that the religion says that God has recruited, has invited humanity, the highest, most developed form of life. In fact, so developed that the Bible, the Torah calls it the image of God. We are God-like. God has given us these qualities, these capacities. A mind, it's not God, God is infinite, but it's a mind that understands the Big Bang and understands creation and understands natural law. Use that mind. We're invited to use that mind to upgrade the world and to make sure that life wins out and to study our own life to make sure that every act we do advances life. Now, this takes the form, according to Jewish tradition, of a covenant, of a partnership, that it's a covenant based on love, love of life, love of God, love of human beings. We commit ourselves that to live on the side of life and every action possible to choose life. However, and this is the original, if you will, or the I hope the contribution of the book, what I say is this covenant, which we all read in the Bible, was started at Sinai or if you will, as a people at Sinai, if you will, goes back to Abraham and the forefathers and foremothers of the Jewish people. What, what I'm arguing is that it wasn't a one-time partnership. It has had been renewed repeatedly, and more important, it has gone through stages. And again, this expresses God's love. God invites the Jewish people to join in this covenant, all of humanity first, and with Noah, and then no Jewish people to join. But in the first stage, God is very much the partner who does the heavy lifting and takes full responsibility. And if you obey God, God will defeat the enemies. God will drown the Egyptian army if they're pursuing the slaves and so on. My argument and simple is that the rabbis taught us that that controlling dominant partner God self-limited voluntarily out of love to get humans to do more and to take on more responsibility. So the rabbinic Judaism grew out of the rabbinic understanding that God is self-limited and therefore the human behavior, the sins that destroyed the second temple were not sins against God as in the first temple, but baseless hatred, meaning civil war, reckless military actions, failure to act with diplomacy toward Rome, and so on and so forth. So the human actions led to the catastrophe. What I'm arguing is that we're now living in the third stage, when God has again self-limited. How do you know God is limited? Well, the rabbi said God became more hidden. Not to hide and abandon us, God became more hidden to come closer to us. And therefore, I'm arguing we're living in the age when God is totally hidden. You don't see any visible or even subtle public visions of God. You don't see outcomes medically that are different because I prayed. So God is totally hidden in the natural order, which means that God is totally present. God is everywhere, but you have to uncover it. You have to discover it. So in this third era, humans are fully responsible, and humans make the difference between life and death. Humans make the difference between redemption and disaster. And of course, the best expression of this idea is what we have lived through, as you mentioned, the Holocaust and the birth, the rebirth, the recreation of the state of Israel. In the Holocaust, we saw a total catastrophe. Why? Because the Jews had no power to protect themselves, because the allies did not use their power to protect the Jews, because the neighbors collaborated with the Nazis and used their power to endanger or to give in the Jews to the Nazi power. And therefore, in this case, humans fail to use power for life, fail to take power or use power for life. Israel represents the whole Jewish people waking up and realizing there is no other choice. If you don't take power, you're living in a world, you'll be wiped out completely. So the whole Jewish people understood the time has come to take the power that God had asked them to do. And Israel represents the Jewish taking of power, the diaspora communities after the war became politically active, and they have tried to take power for life. 
And that's what we're living through now, the opportunity and the challenge of unprecedented levels of power and using them responsibly, ethically, for the sake of life. So it's the third year, and I'm fascinated by it. It, it. With God totally hidden, it means that the leadership will be not formally religious, not genetic priests and prophets designated by God, as in the first period, not rabbis who, by the learning and by the Torah stature, are the leaders in the second period, but rather, I believe, the lay people, the hidden God, representing the hidden God, the so-called secular, whose behavior as secular Jews, as secular professionals, as secular businessmen, is where holiness is found, where the hidden God is present. So it's to me, it's fascinating because it's in a sense we're living at the birth. Uh, if the first era had temple and priests and such and sacrifices, the second era had prayers and synagogues and teachers and education, what will the third era have? Uh, I think it's already emerging, but it, 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 the so-called secular institutions that are doing holy work, like federations, <laughs> like UJA Federation, like one could give other examples, like community centers, which are socially and humanly and personally areas of learning and personal physical growth. One could go on and on. I, I, so my, my, it's and and I believe the leadership. The leadership will be doctors, who are on the frontier of saving life, businessmen who are helping us overcome poverty, which is one of the dreams of the Jewish tradition uh, to to improve the world. Uh, so you name it, social workers who are helping human beings struggle and fulfill their uh, life uh, challenges and needs. And each of these so-called secular or lay leadership is at the same time, if they understand properly, discovering the sacredness of the human life and restoring it. So um, I'm fascinated to see what will happen. What will the new institutions, what will the new uh, leadership, what will the new Torah that we're going to be experiencing in this third iteration? Mm -hmm. Can 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 we squander this opportunity? Can is it, it's it's not a promise. I mean, people could act, you know, sinar chinam, you know, baseless hatred, as you mentioned, um, not taking advantage of all these great gifts. It's it's, it's not a promise that it's going to work, right? It's you know, by the way, that's again, that's part of the maturation. My argument is that the the covenant changes because God, out of love, speaks to us, partners with us at the level we're capable of. So in the first level, honestly, people were less mature, less understanding, and very much stress, reward, and punishment. I do it because God will give me, if you listen to God, it will rain. If you listen to God, you will be wealthy and healthy. Uh, and if not, you'll be punished. And that becomes a very crucial. The rabbis already began to say, that's not the mature, the, a more mature version, which God is now inviting us to be. If you don't serve God, this is the quote of the, Turkey of Old Ethics of the Fathers, don't serve God for the sake of reward, but for the sake of the issue itself, for the sake of the substance and the goodness that you're working for. Now, in the third era, God has given us complete freedom. There is not only complete freedom, humans have the choice, and the Nazis you know, chose that freedom to concentrate on killing and devastation and, and wiping, exterminating the whole Jewish people, at least they tried to. So, A, the evil people are free to use their power for evil, and the good people are free to mislead, to, to squander, to do all the things. In fact, I would say Israel is a classic expression of this as we're living through right now, meaning the Jewish people took power. It's an extraordinary thing of, again, bootstraps, Startup nation, it started with very few natural resources. It started with a poverty and a very low level of economy, and yet has built up to an extraordinarily successful, highly technologically advanced society. It has been, that power has been used to create culture and, and uh, music and books and, and thousands of such examples at the highest level. It has been technologically turned into 
into world leadership and medicine and cybersecurity. One could go on and on. That's the the, the good use. Now, what's the bad use? Well, the honest answer is, I'm afraid my example, I think the present government of Israel and the present leadership, uh, dominated by extremism and unfortunately led by a prime minister, who I think was opportunistically, in order to stay in power, been willing to endanger democracy by invading judicial independence, have been willing to, uh, in my judgment, not use every opportunity to save the hostages. In short, there's no guarantee. In fact, to put it simply, even if Israel was at its best, and I, when I say when it's best, it's still in my mind. In this war, good example, people point to uh, use against Israel that 40,000 Palestinians have died, at least according to the Hamas. Uh, claims, and maybe uh, the UN would say 10,000 more, it, it less, 10,000 left, but okay, that's a tragic number, but if you look at it carefully, half between 17 and 19,000 of those 40,000 are fighters. That means the ratio of civilians killed is 1 or 1.2 or 1.4 to 1. That's unbelievably low ratio in human history. In Afghanistan, where the Allies went all out to reduce civilian casualties because they felt they were fighting for loyalty of the population, the ratio they got down to was three or four civilians for every fighter killed, and they were proud and, and worked very hard at it. Here, Israel has brought the ratio down to less than two to one, and again, it's heartbreaking every single child and, and Palestinian that dies, it's heartbreaking. But they are, but that is happening because they are human shields, because Hamas uses and stations within civilian territory. So again, my argument is Israel, even in this tragic and heartbreaking situation, is exercising a level of moral restraint and a, an ethic of power that is to be admired and appreciated at the same time. And I, and this is so, this is government, this particular government is not up to the standards of the previous 70 years. And what's worse, at a time when Israel is truly endangered, you have, again, it's a free, it's a free world in which evil people are free. You have Iran that is seriously committed to wiping Israel off the face of the map. You have Hamas, whose charter says that not only wiping out Israel, but killing every last Jew in the world is part of their mission. And the truth is, God forbid, that there is an th existential threat in the combination of all these armies. So you're quite right on both levels. There's no guarantee that we will live up to the highest standards, and there's no guarantee that the good guys will win. I would say, just to soften that pain, is to say, we do have a promise from God, from our tradition, that the good will win. We do have this messianic belief that the good guys will win out and the world will be upgraded. But of course, the answer is we live by hope, by the promise that's very different than living by a guarantee and a, and a feeling you can't lose no matter what. Mm -hmm. You've um, Another phrase you've used to talk about this era is, uh, you call it the heroic age of the Jewish people. What makes it heroic? Well, again, heroic, start from the beginning. The fact that a people that was shattered, 30, 35% had been killed. Someone pointed out, not just 35% of the living Jews were killed, but if you look at the scholars and rabbis and students of Talmud full-time in the world in 1939, 80% were wiped out in those years. So as a people that started at a, devastated and, and powerless and, and ineffective uh, stage of their career, and by its own bootstraps built up. There are more people, more rabbis, full-time students of Torah in the world than ever before in Jewish history after 50 years or 70 years after 80% were wiped out. It's heroic in that sense. It's heroic spiritually, but it's heroic also humanly. The cost, the cost of Israel surviving. It was invaded in 48 to be wiped out. It was attacked in 1967 by all the Arab neighbors to wipe it out. 
it is under constant terror threat. So the ability to fight, not to give in, not to lose hope, not to out of frustration turn into raging, you know, monsters who are trying to wipe out the other side. I believe all this is heroic. And the fact is, and to me, this is the most moving thing. If I was told by somebody who's a marginal Jew, if I was a marginal Jew, that, you know, by being Jewish, you are eligible to be wiped out and your children to be destroyed and burnt alive, innocent children, I would run away. The amazing heroism of the Jewish people is that far from running away from the Holocaust, after the Holocaust, or far from running away right now from the threat, there are Jews, of course, who are running away. There are Jews who are trying to buy acceptance in radical circles by hating and rejecting Israel and so on. But the vast majority of Jews have stepped up and stepped forward. Diaspora Jewry, even when Israel is now not the darling of the media, even when it's under constant threat, when Zionism is attacked in toxic ways, the, the, the majority of diaspora Jews have stepped up and said, no, I'm not going to give in to that kind of false defamation or that false witness, nor will I give in to genocidal attempts, but I will stand behind Israel and stand with Israel. So it takes courage, it takes moral courage to exercise restraint, it takes physical courage, and, and at a huge cost. I mean, again, Israel, there are 700 soldiers who have died uh, since October 7th, and, and this, um, more than half of them in the fighting in Gaza. Again, Israel is one-ninth or one-tenth, as, and uh, I take it back, one-thirty-fifth in size of America. If you can imagine the equivalent of 10,000 American soldiers having been killed in the last year, it's extremely devastating, it's painful. If you read the Israeli press every morning when the names are released, the picture, the names, the age, the location, and a little bit of sketch of the person so that every life is really felt and every life is mourned and every life is... But the answer is that parents, and this is why I think Israel will win in the end, the parents understand that they're willing to pay that ultimate price. There's nothing more devastating to a parent than to lose a child. But the answer again is they're prepared to do that for the sake of life. For the, they understand that Israel otherwise could not exist. And so uh, this is literally heroic age in every sense, emotional, physical, moral, military heroism. And every Jew who chooses to live this way, <laughs> I have said many times that every Jew alive, the book opens with that comment, every Jew alive today is a Jew by choice, because they could escape, they could assimilate, they could run away. But instead, they have chosen choice, they've chosen life. They've chosen Jewish life, and they've chosen to upgrade and to make this one of the great ages of Jewish Renaissance. Uh, two, of the, uh, two of the pillars of this, of this heroic age you mentioned were the Holocaust in Israel. Um, and, you know, both of them were both scarring and inspiring for the generation of people who lived, lived through them. Um, we're raising gener maybe now our second generation that has no living memory of, of the Holocaust as it happened there, where our, the numbers of survivors are dwindling. Have you thought about what happens to your ideas for a younger and how they resonate with a younger generation who don't feel viscerally the two great historical moments that brought us to this point? And is there a way to address that if you had to? You know, this question should be on all of our minds, and I, I'm not going to be the only one to answer it, because yeah. you're, we're all going to answer it. It's a tremendously challenging truth. But there are two implications of, of the idea of Israel Holocaust as major events. One is I want we have to reconceive religion. Religion is not about these great events that happened 3,000 years ago, Sinai, or Exodus, or for that matter, in Christianity, the life in Jesus Christ, and one could go on and on. In other words, we think of those religions as the sacredness of the past. What I'm saying is that Jewish religion teaches that religion is about a journey through history toward redemption, toward perfecting the world, toward repairing the world. And therefore, religion is not a one-time or a two-time or a past-time 
event. It is an ongoing event. So the Holocaust in Israel, amazing. It's in the past century, in the past century, the greatest redemptive event of Jewish history, the Exodus, happened 3,000 plus years ago. The greatest destructive event of Jewish history happened uh, in the destruction of a, a temple 2,000 years ago. But in my lifetime, in the past century, the greatest exodus, 10 times greater, not 10 times, but meaningfully greater than the biblical exodus, happened. The, the biblical exodus had 600,000 adults, according to the Torah. I mean, Israel's Yeshuv that survived 48, won the battle, was 600,000. But they were followed by 800,000 Arab Jews who were expelled and came and built new life. They were followed by 2 million Russian Jews, several hundred thousand over the early years and a million and a half after the Soviet Union imploded. They were followed by 150,000 Ethiopian Jews. And one, one, so more, millions more than the original exodus. I've had the exodus in my lifetime and yours. And of course, the Holocaust, again, far outstrips the destruction of the Second Temple. And not only the millions who were killed, but the wiping out of whole worlds of Jewish communities, synagogues, schools, institutions, human generations. So I, I, my, my point is that a, I hope that people will learn from this book that religion, Jewish religion is ongoing. And if you are a religious, and I, to me, I define religion as including all the secular Jews so-called as well. If you are such a person, you are living through what's the equivalent of biblical times, and that's number one implication. Number two implication is I ask, what about the younger generation? You ask, and my answer is, the exodus happened 3,000 years ago, but people are acting on it. It has become central. More Jews keep the Seder than any other ritual. In other words, we turn those events into ritual, into memory, and those memories move and touch us to this day. And so it seems to me that's the equivalent challenge, A, to take the Holocaust, take Israel, and turn it into ongoing and living ritual. We already have Yom HaShoah. We already have the Holocaust Remembrance Day. We already have Israel Independence Day, which I believe are and should be holidays as celebrated as widely and participated in as totally as the earlier ones. That is one way of getting the younger generation in. Another way of getting them in is through teaching or, again, through museum. That's an example of a new institution of the third year. Museums pass, <laughs> U.S. Holocaust War Museum doesn't even pass as a Jewish institution. It passes as an American universal institution. But in fact, it communicates the experience, the total memories, the tragedies and the minor triumphs, the, the resilience and the helpfulness and the faith in the face of suffering and death. It communicates it. So my, that's the second way. In my, through such institutions, we have the challenge of the next generation living these experiences. Birthright Israel, a, a trip, to, trip developed by, with Jewish Life Network in partnership with Brumfin and many other major Jewish institutions, they go and they experience Israel. We're not just talking about theory. We're not just talking about ancient history. Yes, Israel was saved in 48, but to go and see the living experience, that's the way we communicate younger generation. Final comment about this question. It is true, however, that the younger generation is experiencing these ways and our challenge is to make it universal. Birthright Israel raises for, reached 40, 50,000 of the age cohort, 18 to 24, every year. So you can dream of doubling that and reaching the, almost the entire cohort. That in itself, when people have that 10-day experience for a lifetime, they're bounded to Israel, they become more Jewishly committed. So there's an example of how you can do it. But most of all, I say this again, it's more difficult because the media in our time, and particularly in the last few years, has been neutral or even hostile, hostile to the Jewish experience, hostile to the state of Israel. And I mean that literally reporting, the reporting uh, prejudicial, 
the reporting playing down and denying in many cases the terror and the evil on the other side. So as a young person, if I read the media and nothing else, if I'm exposed to the popular culture and nothing else, TikTok is a real danger that I become alienated or that I swallow the party line that Israel is genocidal or, or cruel or oppressor and so on and so forth. So one of the main challenges is not just to improve our educational outreach, our institutional ritual expression of memory. The other challenge is that to train young people to think critically, to filter media. I think of the Russian Jews, for example, not for the Russian people, not Russian Jews, under Stalin, since they knew that the papers were lying, they knew that the media are reporting propaganda, they learn how to read between the lines and know what is true and what is truly moral and how democracy is a better way of living than dictatorship. I, it, that will make or break us. The younger people are not becoming trendy, not becoming simply swallowing the woke culture and things of this sort, but being able to think for themselves and to filter this. This is a major, so we have a job to do to aid it, train them to think more independently and between the lines and to critique and to point out these distortions. Uh, and he, the polls show that the media misrepresentation has had a serious effect, that the younger generation is more detached but again, I think it's a challenge. <laughs> it's a challenge that all of us are have to work on together. So, uh, one one of, I, one of your great contributions is that you talked you 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 uh, talked about it earlier, which is kind of raising the status of lay leadership. Um, I'm old enough to remember when uh, people would dismiss um, philanthropists as checkbook Judaism, as if it was right. But that raises another question about kind of status issues or, or, you know, we have about half the Jews living in Israel, half the Jews living in diaspora. Where, how do you think about, you know, and I'll ask this bluntly, where do Jews belong um, in this age of, of Israel? You know, is, is it a incumbent on Jews to make Aliyah? Or do you feel there's a contribution that the diaspora is, is uh, has its own integrity? I'll ask it that way. Um, these are all good questions and of course I'm thinking as I answer it I spent my life most of my life and most of my professional and personal work and dedication trying to strengthen American Jewry I believe that it reminds me and yet I, I did make Aliyah I would live in Jerusalem and partly because of the Jewish history and partly I admit because of grandchildren <laughs> but having said that it, it is it is something that I uh, reminds me of a conversation as a student. I when I studied with Rabbi Soloveitchik, oh, it's got to be 50, 60 years ago. We sat around the table, and one of the students said to him, "You know, do we all have? To, is it uh, mitzvah? Is it an obligation to do aliyah? Where, where should we go?" And of course, I want you to keep in mind that Soloveitchik also spent his lifetime in America. He was at one point a candidate for chief rabbi, unfortunately didn't get the job, but anyway, uh, but he chose not to go make Aliyah. So his answer was, I thought, really to the point. He said, look, he said, my answer is, he said, you, if you want to live, a, a particularly these are rabbis and in, in formations, if you want to make a major contribution, if you want to live your life, my answer is, uh, my answer is, which place you feel you can do more, which place you feel you can contribute, which place your talents and your particular capacities will make the greatest contribution and the greatest fulfillment and that would be my answer i think that's a good description everybody and if, the only thing i would add to that so i say again the answer is i believe one can argue that israel is where jewish history is primarily being made now uh, that is true on the other hand i think personally that the jews are throughout the world of the diaspora are a major part a of not just the outcome of history, of accident history, they're the outcome, I believe, of a divine plan that the presence of the world to be a moral model, to be a light on temptations, to be influenced, to make a contribution to the upgrading the quality of life in America. And I, that's a major challenge 
the Jews learning to use the Jewish values and the Jewish religious insights to strengthen America. And the Haredi solution that you make a ghetto may help them not be assimilated, but it doesn't help to make the contribution to American life that I think Jews should make. So my personal answer is the two are basically should be in symbiosis with each other. I once said this jokingly, but I mean it seriously. What's the single best way to strengthen Aliyah? The answer, of course, is for Israel to become such a magnet, such a high quality life, such a high, uh, that Jews will want to go. We have a bad connection, I think. Uh, there is. If you, you know, offer you, American Jewish oh, life. Just a second there, Rabbi. So I'm just, you can keep going, but. No, so if, if you upgrade American Jewish life, if people become more Jewish, more deeply engaged in the religion, then more of them will make Aliyah. So the best way to strengthen American Jewry is to inspire them by the Israeli model. And that will strengthen American Jewry. Paradoxically, it will also, when American Jewry makes is stronger, it will it will give strength to Israel and make Aliyah more possible. So the truth is, it's not just that they're in symbiosis, but that literally each improving each one strengthens the other one, and each one is strengthened by the quality of the partner of the Israel. So to me, that is what the future holds. And of course, thanks to modern technology, you can be in Israel in a few hours. You can be in Israel instantly on Zoom, as we are at this moment. So to me, that's the best answer to your question, mm -hmm. that each of these is a personal decision. It should reflect in part where you can make a contribution, but it also should reflect not a binary either or, but a genuine strengthening, sharing experience to each other. The birthright people come back from Israel, they love Israel, but they also become more Jewish. They Their intermarriage rates drop, their choice of activity on campus for Jewish activities goes up. So the experience of Israel inspires them to be better diaspora Jews. And of course, I won't say, Israeli Jews who come to America and spend time in America and are inspired by it, frequently go back and have a much greater, a much greater uh, Jewish feeling in Israel and building Israel. I think of the birthright trips, it was really moving. When we first started, we had this idea, Charles Brown and I want to give him personal credit, of getting Israelis to travel with every bus of 25 Americans, at least get four or five Israelis to travel. Well, in the first year or two, we couldn't get very effective co-travelers because because why? Because the Israeli kids in college years are in the army. Mm -hmm. So they weren't available. So they, we had to go get 12th, you know, 12th year high school students. We had to get people who for various reasons were not uh, busy working and were available. It, it, despite that, it, it went very well. But the few soldiers who we did get came back totally inspired because... <laughs> They had never seen themselves through the eyes of the diaspora Jews. Our heroes, you're protecting the Jewish people. You are taking, you're risking your life. You're... So they came back so inspired that the army literally had a review and they came back to us and they said, you know something? This is the best training for morale, for inspiring will to fight ability. So they said, we'll give you as many soldiers as you can take on these trips because it becomes a terrific a way of, but it's the equivalent of months of training, military training. Mm -hmm. So again, to me, that's the model in my mind, that in meeting each other and in looking at each other with the eyes of the vision of the Jewish religion and Jewish future, that these two communities will strengthen each other. And so Aliyah will not weaken American Jewry, it will strengthen it. And of course, Israel's uh, um, will not be undermined or lost because American Jews have become independent. Yeah. Um, at this point, I'm going to encourage um, some of our viewers, if you do have questions for Rabbi Greenberg, you can drop them into the Q&A. I see there are a couple there already. I'll, I'll take a look. Um, I think one um, you've already addressed, and the other one I think we'll, we'll, we'll put into another. Um, we may get to. Here in the United States, I mean, I, this is, you know, 
obviously more true in Israel, but October 7th has really felt like a rupture for a lot of people that I've been speaking to. Um, so many, you know, everything from rising anti-Semitism to, you know, rifts within the Jewish community. Um, and uh, one of the biggest ones being, you know, young people who are criticizing Israel in a way that even liberal Zionists, you know, find a little bit shocking, uh, more than a little bit. Uh, I'm just curious, in October 7th, did it challenge, you know, um, some of the ideas, not just in your book, but you've had your whole life? Um, and, you know, and I guess also ask that personally, what's it been for you living in Israel during this kind of really, you know, cataclysmic time? October 7th was very shattering, very shocking to me and to the whole Israeli population. And again, in the emotional response, more Jews were killed in one day than any day since the Holocaust. Well, many Israelis, not a few, not, not a majority, but many said, isn't this a refutation or a destruction of the Zionist vision? The one thing we all talked about is having a state of Israel where Jews are safe, where they can live safely. And here Israel failed to protect over a thousand people who were killed in that day and abducted and raped. And and my answer was, that's, a, that's wrong. Because why? Because the, it's not the Holocaust. Because the truth is the Holocaust, six million died, because that one day was repeated every day for years and years and years of murder because there was no power and no state and no army to check the Nazi behavior. So the answer is, even a devastating day with Holocaust-like losses doesn't disprove the correct vision of the Zionist movement that Israel as a state would offer haven and security, the law of return that guarantees any Jew in danger anywhere in the world automatic right to citizenship and haven and safety. So the answer is, in fact, the best proof is that those 1,000 or 2,000 terrorists who invaded and destroyed in the South were killed or wiped out in the next two or three days by the Israeli army belatedly. So number, so number one is as shattering as it is, one has to understand what we have accomplished. Number two is I'm devastated that I, I feel guilty too. I thought that the plunge in anti-Semitism because it was associated with the Holocaust, I it really, I thought it was permanently delegitimized. Well, I was wrong. And what I understand now, we all understand now that it was still there there's no easy, quick solutions. I still believe that Holocaust education and exposure is essential so people understand how this evil hatred leads to ultimate evil and hatred. But nevertheless, I didn't expect it. So my answer again is we have to draw upon our reserves of faith and hope as Jews. Number one is look at the past. The fact is what could be worse than the total wipeout 50 years ago and yet the Jewish people got up and rebuilt. So the outburst of anti-Semitism, my answer is we have to just get up and fight and understand that it's hard. And there are more people of goodwill. I want to make one comment also about the radical progressive, the left particularly. Now, the, most of the anti-Semitism still remains on the right. But the left, the, the, the vicious critique, the, with all due respect, those who are in upholding Palestinian, which is a legitimate position, but in upholding, spreading false and evil, Israel's apartheid, that Israel is genocidal, frankly, that is a violation, and it really is justification and paving the way, normalization, for the genocidal intentions. Iran is genocidal. Hezbollah and Hamas in their charter are genocidal. So the people who, in the name of upholding morality are calling Israel genocide. What they're really doing is cooperating in spreading the kind of vicious lie that will justify the attempt to wipe out Israel totally. So that's number one. Number two is bluntly what this radical development of anti-Israel, anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism shows is that the left right now is seriously struggling with pathologies. I think those pathologies are include such things as class morality rather than individual morality. That if you're in the oppressor class, you can do no right. If you're in the oppressed class, you can do no wrong. It's false. It's misleading morally. So I want to compare this to what happened after World War I. 
after World War I than college campuses, universities. And the left, or the extreme left particularly, became pacifist. So many people died, such a terrible war. They became pacifists. So when Winston Churchill, when he warned of the Nazi danger, at the Oxford Union, they booed him and they called him a war criminal and a genocidal, they didn't say genocidal in those days, they, uh, someone who's, who's out for war and death and destruction. But it turned out, in retrospect, that this was a distortion of the left that showed a pathology which was not corrected. And I would say the same thing here, the distortion about Israel shows a pathology which, if it's not corrected, will destroy the left will undermine the morality of the left and of the, uh, the extreme left. I want to make clear the majority of the left is not there. The extreme left, the radical left. And I, to my mind, the Jewish model, the Jewish criteria, how are they interpreting Israel? How are they interpreting Jewish rights? How are they playing along with anti-Semitism and hatred and, and genocide? My answer is that's a signal, not that we are wrong and that we should back away from Israel, but that we have to help them cure the pathology before it takes them down. I believe after the World War II, people look back with shame at the student behavior and at this false allegations of warmonger against Churchill. I believe 10 years from now or when we're through this crisis, people will look back and say that the, the squad and the progressive radical left that spread these false charges was themselves morally corrupt and degraded and we were justifying terror and death. So yes, I, so I think part of our challenge again is to get our people to have the courage to do what Jews have always done as a minority, say the truth, even if it's not trendy, even if there is a consensus on the other side, we have to be able to stand up and tell the truth as we know it. And I believe we have that capacity. If, if the left is, the rest of the left is wise, they will listen and correct themselves if they want. I believe they will go into the, the, the hall of shame of history as people who, in the name of human rights, in the name of all sorts of elevated, noble claims, were in fact um, pawns, useful idiots, and uh, carriers of uh, attempted genocide and attempted uh, murder and anti Semitism. I'm going to I'm going to read one question here as as it's written, but I also but I think I want to ask it in a way that um, might be more useful for our conversation. So th th someone asked, how do you square Jewish love of life with the current settler attacks on Palestinians in the West Bank? And I think the broader question there is, how do you assess the challenge to Israel from a, from a you know an extremist flank? that I think is flouting a lot of the ideas that I think you, I know you, you have for the Jewish people. I, I would go as far to say you, they're, they're not expressing the kind of Jewish values that you're writing about, but how do you, how do you, I guess, how do you combat that? And how do you think about it watching from the diaspora? It's a very troubling, very troubling phenomenon. I said it earlier, it, it's troubling and, and they are getting away with it. Again, it's, it's a small group. I don't claim it's the majority of the settlers. But it doesn't matter. The fact is that these are violations of human rights and of human dignity. They are violations of the law, violations of democracy. And the truth is, they're not being prosecuted and not being stopped enough. It's not only a total contradiction of Jewish values. It's offensive to human morality and conscience. And it plays into the hands and strengthens the hands of those who are trying to make Zionism toxic. So my answer in this case is, they should be condemned. I, I, I think, uh, and I, and I criticize, and I, and I, um, I have to live with the fact that he, right now he's democratically elected prime minister, and that he has, the, until until that government falls, he has the, the decision making power. But he is the one who legitimized the Ben Gvirs, the extremist, who, and then appointed him to head of the police. And this is disgraceful, and he in turn is telling the police not to crack down on the settlers, and so on. And of course, the head of the Shin Bet, the internal Israel security, has written publicly saying that this approach, the settler attacks, and Ben Gvir's attitudes are endangering the state of Israel as well as impugning its moral dignity. So, my answer is we have to fight this and challenge this. I believe that the next elections will show 
that a significant, overwhelming majority of Israel repudiate this behavior. But in the meantime, they're doing a lot of damage, including damage to the Palestinians, which is offensive. And I think it's very important that we not justify it. It's also important to keep perspective and not to label the whole country or the whole people. But yes, the fact that they're in government and they're ministers impugns, undermines Israel's moral standing, and it's a very sad and heartbreaking, and it's certainly a gross violation of Jewish values. You know, Ben Gavir, of course, was a disciple of Mayor Kahane. I, I, I debated Mayor Kahane in the 1970. He, we grew up as childhood friends, and it was, it was a heartbreaking experience to see him, because we both responded to the Holocaust, and he responded in a legitimate way by saying, Jews have to defend themselves. Jews have to be willing to use force. All that was good. But he took that extra step of saying, in light of the Holocaust, I can do anything. I can violate norms. I can abuse. I can I can spread anti, anti lack or anti-Gentile attitudes. I once had, I had this, there was a classic case, Russian... Um, a ballet came or something. Saul Hurok was a Jewish impresario who organized that trip. Um, Kahana talked a immature, irresponsible Jewish student to plant a bomb in that office. It went off and it killed a secretary sitting at the desk. That student, some years later, believe it or not, um, was in my class at City College in Jewish Studies. And we became friends and we talked and he'd be Kahana always denied that he was the one who, who you know, influenced the student. He got away with it. They could never prosecute him. And and uh, and uh, the student told me he, he was incentivized. He was influenced to do it. Anyway, shortly after I met Kahana, again it was part of the disengagement experience, and and his and I was the friendship was dying because I was so shocked and offended by his applicant. I ran to him and I said, you know, this student told me that you were the one who told him to do it. And you did this in the name of, you know, fight the Holocaust and respond to it. I said, you know, you know who died in the Holocaust? Innocent secretaries were put to death in the Holocaust. So I said, you're not fighting the Holocaust, you're carrying it on. Of course, he dismissed it and he Unfortunately, but at that point in the stage of life, with bravado justified. Now, this kind of teaching, this warping of a legitimate and important idea that we have to respond to the Holocaust by fighting and by, has been warped into the Ben Gvirs that we have a right to abuse Arabs or we have a right to treat their life as less valuable, or and so on. And it, it is a, um, it is a moral cancer on Jewish religion, and I think it has to be fought and condemned. And Ben Gvira, unfortunately, having been made legitimate, is pulling and polling probably five, six, seven percent of the Israeli population. Well, again, that's to me, it's very disappointing, but again, seven percent, there must be seven percent of people in America who are willing to support terror and so on. So my answer is, it's, it's in democracy, sometimes extreme minorities can get influence and, and and do things that you know that are very bad but i believe in the long run democracy will assert itself and the majority will eliminate and certainly if there's a new election then you will be out of the government even if he gets the same amount of votes and knesset members no one will touch him with a 10-foot pole because they understand the the, the incompetence and the moral abusiveness of such a position. In the meantime, it's really terrible. And so that, that was an optimistic note. In the, in the one minute we have remaining, I just wanted to ask you because I want to make sure that people go out with a little koyach, as we say, which is, are, are, you, are you optimistic? You've seen the sweep of Jewish history from the Holocaust through the present moment. Do you find yourself at this stage of your life an optimist? Jewish people has shown consistently over history not just 75 years of Israel's history, but over thousands of years, that we respond to death by creating life and by reasserting life. Israel is the greatest outburst of life in Jewish history. It's not an accident that it comes after the greatest death experience of Jewish history. 
So I'm an optimist, but I'll end with a more positive word. I mentioned it before. I am hopeful. Odlo of that tikva tenu, the tikva is a, a song of hope. What's hope? Hope is a vision, a dream of a perfect world, but it's unlike a dream, it, it is committed to become in the real world an achieved reality. So how do you do that? You back hope, and that's a definition of hope, a hope that is backed by a policy, by action, by a program to transform the world. So my answer is, I am hopeful. It's going to be a very difficult short-term period. We face great threats and great obstacles, but I really believe that the Jewish people will come through, that they will rise to the highest level of horizon, and that 10 years from now or 20 years from now, we will see a renaissance and a, a flowering of the best in Jewish life, the best in Israel. And yeah, I'm not sure I'll be here for that, but I can, I remember you heard it here first. I, I, that would be my prediction. That would be my prediction. And I believe Jewish history gives us good reason. We have reason to hope and to believe this way for the past. And you hear that soon. Rabbi Greenberg, the name of the book is The Triumph of Life. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for staying up this late, because I know it's late in Israel. Um, and thank you to our partners again at UJ Federation uh, and the New Jewish Week uh, for their Folio Culture Series. Uh, watch your emails for upcoming events in the series. And um, again, Rabbi Greenberg, thank you. And to everyone on the call, a good night. Thank you very much.